everyone and welcome back to SALT Talks. My name is Rachel Pether and I'm a senior advisor to Skybridge Capital, as well as being the MC for SALT, a thought leadership forum and networking platform that encompasses business, technology and politics. Now SALT Talks is a series of digital interviews with some of the world's foremost investors, creators and thinkers. And just as we do at our Global Salt Conference series, we aim to empower really big, important ideas and give our audience a window into the minds of subject matter experts. Today, I'm very excited to be speaking to Nathan Galba. Nathan is the founder and chief investment officer of Stanford Associates, which he founded in 1985 with the vision to improve the traditional investment consulting model for UK pension schemes. Since then, it's grown to become a leading international investment consultancy firm, and the Telegraph in the UK actually noted that it was perhaps the world's most thorough system of fund research for the, the way that they incorporate behavioral psychology into the investment process. Prior to founding Stanford, Nathan worked for Orion Bank in London and Hill, Samuel and Co. Nathan, welcome to Salt Talks. Thank now, you very much. A pleasure to be with you. Now, you have a wealth of experience that expands over 40 years. So maybe just start by telling me a bit about your personal background. Um, I started uh, working in, in the city um, in the long distant past, about um, 45 years ago, um, and um, cut my teeth uh, at uh, two, two investment banking firms, one called Orion Bank Limited, the other one, as you say, Hill Samuel and Co Limited, where I work predominantly in corporate finance as well as in um, investment management. Um, after 10 years, I started my own business uh, um, with the idea to help institutional investors to improve their investment outcomes by assisting them devising uh, efficient investment strategies and populate those with the best investment management talent we're able to, to find for them. Um, and when we look, looking at the firm now, you see we employ roughly 42 people, have a global reach when it comes to placing our clients' assets with talented investment managers and oversee assets in excess of 70 billion pounds. Within the 42 people that you have, how many behavioral psychologists do you employ? Uh, we have um, worked with, with um, behavioral psychologists for the better of 20 years. It started as an experiment and uh, developed into a very significant part of our analytics. And as we sit here today, we employ full time three qualified psychologists under the leadership of Professor Adrian Furnham, who used to be uh, head of behavioral finance at UCL in London, a preeminent behavioral psychology. So behavioral psychology now is much more mainstream than it was, you know, 30, 20, even 10 years ago. What initially generated your interest in this area? As, as you well know, uh, Rachel, the mainstream um, of behavioral psychology really looks um, predominantly at uh, the behavior of groups. Um, um, and tries to identify the traits that group behaviors display. We have taken this one step further because we're more interested in the behavior of individuals and individual differences. So the focus of our effort is uh, profiling personalities of investment professionals and those who are involved in the investment process to understand their decision-making process. And so what does this actually look like in practice when you go into investment teams and then assess individuals? How do you actually incorporate the behavioral psychology element? Um, the, the, our work is, is holistic in nature and comprises investment analytics, as you would imagine, from a firm such as ours. And uh, it integrated with it um, are the psychologists. So they are integral parts of our investment team and participate in each uh, of our engagements with external managers, whether it is 
during the appraisal and assessment process, or whether it relates to ongoing management monitoring, we always have a psychologist sit next to us at the table to observe things which the untrained eye simply cannot see. And so we've actually- um, And the... feed in. I'm sorry. sorry. You continue? The, the psychologists feed into our overall appraisals and to the extent that they raise concerns, we take those concerns very seriously and have been instances where the psychologists gave us strong advice not to pursue a given, given mandate because they just, for example, didn't feel comfortable with the decision making made by a group of individuals. I'd love to come back to some specific case studies of the managers that you have, let's say, rejected for want of a better word, but we've already had a question coming in from the audience on what are some of the key questions that you ask your potential fund managers? So, and how detailed is the questionnaire? Um, well, the, 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 the questionnaire we sent out um, is, is a standard form um, of questionnaire, which, which basically uh, tries to summarize the investment process and the individuals involved in those processes. It is more of what we would describe as fundamental due diligence. The substance of our assessment and appraisal process takes place at face-to-face -face meetings with, with prospective managers. And as I mentioned earlier, those meetings are attended by the psychologists as well. Um, whilst we on the investment side are essentially looking for evidence of investment edge, um, um, exceptional talent, um, and a consistency of application of a well-designed investment process, the psychologists have 14 criteria which they are interested in. Those include curiosity, independent thinking, um, the, 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 the um, willingness to, um, uh, to go against the crowd and not be a follower. So there's a whole, whole uh, slew of different aspects which they are, they are considering. And it all goes into the melting pot. Uh, psychology together with investment, and we think that's how it should be. Um, the, the sad thing in our industry is that the great majority of participants rely on past as, a, as an in indicator for the future. We all know that it, that is a very unreliable indicator. However, human behavior is such that uh, we, we have behavioral patterns which repeat and are therefore more, more reliable. And in the context of making the investment decisions, um, in the absence of complete information, those behavioral aspects become a key determinant of success and, and repeatability of that success. I love that approach that past performance doesn't equal future performance, but past behaviors do. And just to dive a bit deeper into um, some of the managers that you haven't gone with because of this analysis, there have been a number of high profile downfalls of managers recently. Did, you, did any of these come across your radar? And maybe tell me an example of a manager that you, you didn't go with because of incomplete information. Uh, well, the, um, the easiest example is Bernie Madoff. Um, as you know, Bernie Madoff uh, attracted a lot of attention um, uh, from investors and, and was able to, to accumulate good assets under management. Um, he knocked at our door twice in an attempt to, to attract capital from, from our clients. And um, we stipulated certain disclosure and transparency requirements, none of which Madoff met. And so we didn't even get Madoff in front of our psychologist. Um, we said, no, um, no, no, thank you. Um, transparency is key to our ability to analyze and assess managers. And we make this very clear at the outset of any contact uh, when it comes to appraising managers and managers 
be forewarned balance of the thoroughness and granular detail, both from the investment perspective as well as from a psychological angle, and forewarn them that an engagement with us may not only be very time consuming and labor intensive, but may also extend over, over longer time periods and the help of our process before we engage in, in, in analysis. So, um, and all by the wayside, um, because they're not able or willing to be transparent uh, and others because they just don't fill, fill the criteria. We have very high standards and um, our clients' capital is important to all of us. And we want to make sure that the stewardship of this capital goes into those hands that we deem to be the most capable investors we can find. So given this then and the, the emphasis on transparency, what are your views on quant managers? And I guess by extension of that, the, the increase that we're seeing in artificial intelligence and in investment management. Yeah, we've um, we, we thought long and hard about both the use of artificial intelligence as well as quant-based managers uh, on behalf of our clients, because in theory, strategies could that could be a very good diversifier uh, relative to the, the other more fundamental strategies that we are we are, we are embracing for our clients. The disappointing. Um, conclusion that we have reached relating to both of those is that we are unable to garner sufficient transparency and clarity about the underlying processes to endorse those. So uh, to this date, we have not used any quant-based or AI strategy. And unless managers are willing to share what we would deem to be the black box content with us, it's impossible for us to make a professional assessment and we just can't endorse something which we don't really understand how it functions. Yeah, that makes sense. And I do have a couple more questions on the behavioral side before moving on to some more audience questions. How have you seen the acceptance of behavioral psychology change over time, given that you've been working in this area for a number of decades now? Um, well, if you look at the wider marketplace, uh, I'm, I'm actually not aware whether any consultancy firm such as ours has embraced um, behavioral psychology the same way we embraced it and apply it in, in practice. Um, um, is, it a, is it a sign of things to come? Possibly. What we found is that our own track record has improved tremendously since embracing behavioral psychology as part and parcel of our life. We've gone from a hit rate, um, a major selection hit rate of roughly 51, 52% to 82% over the last 20 years, which is a clear indication that psychology must be a helpful ingredient of our overall decision-making process. And indeed it's helpful picking the right managers. But it's not only picking the right managers, it's also sitting through them through periods of underperformance without losing one's nerve. And indeed, using psychology to say goodbye to a manager when perhaps the underlying performance numbers don't suggest that it is time to do so. So pro-cyclical behavior is not something which we endorse or engage with. It could be coincidental to what we're doing but we are much more driven by looking into the future based on our most recent behaviors than anything else. So just a quick question, how do you actually define hit rate when you mention it's increased from just over 50% to 82? How do you, how do you define hit rate? What we, um, what we are doing is we're looking at manager appointment and the benchmark relative to which a manager um, um, has been appointed. And we measure whether or not over a protracted time period, let's say five or 10 years, the manager has put an investment return in excess of the benchmark net of fees. So if you take the 82%, 
roughly, uh, you will find that um, it means that four out of five managers that we recommended and appointed have exceeded those benchmarks based on the criteria I just, I just explained. So one out of five, if you like, has been a dot, was four out of five have been successful. And of course, the, the math works in such a way that when you take them together, i.e. on an aggregate basis, we are doing, uh, they're, they're delivering to our clients. We would like to improve our hit rate, but it's tough, we think. And talent is not easy to find. No, that's certainly true. And I guess that leads quite nicely into the, the next question. Obviously, during the current pandemic, a lot of, well, everyone actually is seeing levels of stress that they're not used to. And, you know, everyone is under high pressure situations. In this current environment, what are some of the most common biases that you're seeing within your managers? What, what, we, are, what we are hoping for are behaviors which are consistent with the investment process that our clients bought into. So we are um, uh, observing whether or managers, whether or not managers portfolio footprints are consistent uh, with our expectations. We're not necessarily second guessing whether they buy Shell and sell BP and whether these were good or bad decisions. It's much more a question of following the process as we set out at the beginning of our arrangement with them. During crisis periods, it is particularly important that managers stick to the guns and are not being tossed around by noise in the market. And um, when I look at one common denominator, if you like, amongst all the 40 plus managers that we're currently using for our clients, um, it is that behavioral aspect of sticking to your guns through thick or thin. It doesn't mean that you don't take into account the investment environment and the news flow, but you don't expect a knee-jerk reactions. So the biases amongst those managers remain to be steadfast in the investment philosophy and the application of the process. And that's what we've seen this time around and in many other crises as well. Uh, managers usually are long-term long orientated have high conviction, i.e. concentrate portfolios. And uh, what, we, what we do see again in, in, in situations such as this is that they average down on their most attractive holdings. And again, that's something that we would expect, um, expect in a scenario like that. Mm. Now we've had a number of audience questions coming in and some are related to your specific approach and some to the market. So I'll ask some related to your specific approach first. Have you done performance attribution in terms of asset allocation versus manager selection? And if so, what have some of the results been? Yes, the, um, uh, the, um, we, have, we have undertaken um, analysis um, of asset allocation versus um, uh, manager selection and uh, security selection in particular. And what we find is that the asset allocation, the long-term asset allocation is a key driver to overall return. It also speaks to the risk profile of any given, given investor. And uh, from investor to investor, this is a very individualistic assessment. Once the asset allocation has been determined, we encourage our clients not to uh, apply short-term tactical asset allocation, but stick to their strategic goals and use market volatility for rebalancing purposes. Um, because of our skepticism vis-a-vis -vis people's ability to add value through tactical asset allocation, rebalancing, we believe, is the second best solution for long-term asset allocation and what it means in practice is that by rebalancing, you sell high and you buy low, which to us is a very attractive value proposition. In terms of um, added value through management selections through, through stock picking, and again, over long time periods, it is not unreasonable to expect an added value of roughly 2% per annum 
net of fees in excess of a state market benchmark, which over long time periods adds considerable value as you can, can imagine. However, excess returns can be very well. And these kind of active strategies are not necessarily for the faint hearted because of their deviation from both an absolute benchmark and a relative benchmark over shorter time periods. Within Stanford then, Nathan, do you have your own style biases? And I guess this goes back to a question from the audience as to what's your recent view on the dominance of growth stocks versus value stocks? We, we, um, we, we do have certain biases that must not necessarily be characterized as style biases. But if I may just summarize them for, for a moment or two, and we're trying to understand the implication of those biases. So um, we are really quite allergic towards capital impairment. So one of, the, one of the areas we are paying a lot of attention to is trying to understand how managers think about capital impairment or realize losses. And in our analysis of past behaviors, we're particularly keen to understand how losses have been occurred and why. And the repeatability of a fairly high loss rate in, in a given strategy is something that would concern us at the time. So we have a bias towards capital preservation, which leads us um, uh, leads us more to value type managers, but not exclusively value type managers, because growth managers can also have a capital preservation mindset, which is um, perfectly acceptable. But the volatility around um, capital pres preservation in growth oriented strategies is so much greater and therefore so much riskier than it is in value type, type strategies. Um, other biases we have relate to long time periods where we and our clients are long-term investors. So um, managers who have high portfolio turnover are not necessarily the ones we would favor. Equally, um, we are not great friends of high leverage in companies. So we are looking towards managers that are not necessarily running highly leveraged types of portfolios through the underlying investments. Um, we're looking for people who have integrity, uh, both integrity of thought as well as integrity of ethics and morals. Um, and people have a mindset which is clients first. Duty of care um, and, and governance, good governance is key to what we think we are delivering to our clients. So these so, are fairly material buying, which eliminate a fairly warp of market participants. And so looking at, we've also had a question coming in from the audience on emerging markets. What's your view on emerging markets and assessment there? And are you seeing demand from clients in the likes of, you know, India and, and Africa and other emerging markets? Now, we've been engaged in emerging markets for the better part of the last 35 years. We've been always exposed to emerging markets and managers um, who operate in those markets, both sitting in developed markets and those who are resident in, in India or, or China or Hong Kong or in any other markets that could be, could be relevant. Um, our experience um, has been favorable over years, although the governance aspect uh, of the underlying, relating to the underlying investments is one which is not always compared to Western standards. So we have a particular level of caution when it comes to understanding how managers think about governance in particular and the oversight over the deployment of our clients' capital. So it is, um, it's an area which has been rewarding for us. It's an area that has displayed considerable volatility and you are aware of the various crises in the months, whether it was the Russia crisis or the ones relating to the Far East some time ago. Um, with the preservation of capital mindset, we are particularly cautious 
but exposed to those markets. And you talk a lot about governance, which I guess is inherently embedded in your process. If you're looking at ESG, obviously another big theme at the moment, do you also focus on the other letters within that? Do you also look at environmental and social issues or is it really more the governance piece that you're focused on? Yeah, our, our predominant interest um, from our client's perspective is in the investment oversight and investment governance. However, as we look at managers, we are keen that they look at the other aspects of ESG as well. So between the underlying managers and ourselves, we cover the entire spectrum of ESG to make sure that our client's capital is deployed in a responsible, responsible and transparent fashion. It's important. It's important. No, I couldn't agree more. And just one final question. We've had someone ask for a recommendation from you actually, which is, do you have some recommendations for small institutional investors, as well as family offices in terms of effective manager selection when perhaps they have less resources and depth to do a full assessment? Mm. It's a tricky and challenging question. Um, our, our view is that um, it, it's very difficult to identify talent ex ante if we all accept that past record is not a reliable indicator for the future. It is equally difficult to analyze both from a behavioral as well as from an investment perspective what the prospects of a given investment proposition are. Investment managers are excellent in making presentations and preparing pitches. The reality often looks very different and the ability to differentiate between a marketing pitch and reality is not always that easy. So it needs resources and experience to avoid election mistakes and pick those that will do well over time, but also unpick those when the time has come, perhaps that they're running out of steam for one read the other. And what we are saying to family offices and, um, and smaller institutions who do not have the internal resources to either work with a firm like ours, where we can be helpful in one way or the other, or go passive. Um, passive is a very attractive way of uh, gaining exposure to various markets and capturing beta and not try and capture alpha when the downside is, is, is can be quite unattractive. No, so either with somebody you have confidence in or, or do it yourself on a passive basis. Yeah, because I guess even going passive is an active decision, isn't it? And one that you have to decide yes. for yourself. Excellent. Well, exactly. Thank you so much for your time today, Nathan. It's been a pleasure talking to you as always, and I look forward to continuing this discussion on, on behavioral finance at a future date. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you.